in this video, I would like to give you an overview as to how a look designer for Adobe Premiere works. And together we're going to go and create our first look using look designer. So once you have installed look designer, go into effects and in effects search tab, type look designer and straight away under color intelligence, you're going to find the plugin and drag and drop it onto a clip you want to start working with. So the first thing we're going to do is actually going to open our profiles. So the first thing we need to do is we need to say, okay, what is the camera that this was shot with? There is a list as long as an arm of cameras that is supported from Ari, Blackmagic Design, Canon, DaVinci, DJI, Filmic Pro, iPhone, you know, archive footage, RED camera, Sony camera, you know, Z cam, Nikon. I suppose we have most of the cameras that are on the market today, but you can expect this list to get bigger as new cameras get released. This was shot with Ari, so I'm just going to go select Ari. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to select the output that I want. So let's see what output options do I have. So there is basically ACES CCT, if I ever want to work in advanced workflows. I can go back to Ari, log C. I can even work uh, together with DaVinci in DaVinci Wide Gamut. I can go to film scan if I feel like printing it back to film. I can deliver to Netflix, I can deliver to Amazon, or I can deliver to HLG for BBC Live, or you know, linear for visual effects. If I work for Mac Pro devices, I can deliver in P3D65. There are several versions of Rec 709 depending to what option you want, like Ari's option that has this beautiful Ari skin tones, Da Vinci's option, or for example, color intelligence option, or you want to go straight SEMPTY, the standard option. So you have several other you know, ways how you can deliver. If you want to deliver optimized for internet, you probably want to select an sRGB. I'm going to go ahead and select Ari 709 to begin with because I'm going for very filmic look and since it's shot with Ari camera, I want to remain in that. Before I start tweaking my look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll to the bottom and here I'm going to find Add Lachman Zones. This is something that looks probably similar if you've ever seen um, false color, but it works completely different. So actually if you press this kind of Ed Lachman Zones guide, what you're going to see is stops as of exposure. So effectively what it is is like a light meter. So you can see exactly how your shot is exposed. So let's have a look, you know, I have a gray around zero, a little bit underexposed. So I think, yeah, that looks pretty good to me actually. So we can start working with this particular shot. So let me now introduce you to the elements of your look from top to bottom. First thing here, what you got is gamut limit. There is no need for me to use gamut limit on this shot. Anytime you get like funny color distortions in one of our future uh, tutorials, I'm going to explain how this one works. I would be using gamut limit. The next thing we have is printer lights. And printer lights is actually closest to get to exposure changes. So what I'm going to do is, for example, if I'm going to make something a little bit darker, or a little bit brighter. It's really like exactly what you know ISO or you know aperture on a lens would be doing. Okay, printer lights also work in red, green, and blue channels, which is something that back in the day film colorists used to use a lot and get you know some beautiful results of balancing film prints just using these three lights. Then we get standard lift gamma gain that you have probably seen in any of the you know, three-way color correctors. But then we come to a very interesting subtractive color. So subtractive color emulates the way how layers of film emulsion work. So you have a cyan, magenta, and yellow. And what they emulate is the density of those layers. So for example, I can just increase the density a little bit like this, but also I can bring some crosstalk by changing a density of specific layers. So I can just, for example, you know, cool it down with cyan, add a little magenta for the skin, and then just warm it up a little bit. So you see, 
this is really where the magic of film kind of comes, why we get these beautiful skin tones, simply because it works in a slightly different way. The way how colors are combined does not work in the same way like digital cameras. And this is one of the most useful tools you're probably going to find inside the look designer. What happens after I reduce the density, I need to go and use my push and pull. So this is my next control because I have kind of darkened my image a little bit. I need to bring it back to the exposure that I felt was correct. If I want, I can always go and check with the Dachman zones where I am. Looking very good right now. Perfect. Let's go and move on to the next step. Then we get temperature. You've probably seen these controls as well. Um, the difference is that this temperature emulates the temperature of the light bulb of the projector. And actually, projectors used to run in something called the D60 xenon light bulbs that were a little bit warmer. So for example, by me changing this setting a little bit, I can emulate that kind of style of warmer projected light. Then at the end here, I have a saturation. So you probably know what it does, where I can control saturation in case you know my density layers and everything has in affected it and then I come all the way to negative options so negative options is really where I decide at what negative do I want this material to be like filmed on okay so I have four categories negative stock one negative stock generation two major and minor so basically this is a library of stocks that I have collected over the years from different laboratories that also help us somehow resurrect some film stocks that we didn't have or that we can't really get access to. So for example, there is some AGFA film stock or like we can also work in a reversal, Kodak Ektachrome. You know, I am going to go and make some more tutorials that are going to explain a little bit how this film stock work. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to use generation one reversal stock and then I'm going to go into my negative intensity and check do I want a more of that intensity or less? So I have a, like a fine tune ability to my negative stock. Next, I'm going to move on to printing. Printing is really where the magic of, of film used to happen, where we were able to influence how we would want our print to look by choosing different curves to begin with. So any one of these F1 contrast curve, F2, F3, they are all different film print curves. So you can use exactly accurate film curves from 2383 Kodak, which is one of the most popular film stocks. Or you can use some S curves as well if you want. They are like more generic. Or you can use some flat curves like, you know, L2. So the options are there. And really, in future tutorials, I'm going to explain to how important these curves are and how you're going to be working best with them. For the beginning, let's just stick with Kodak 2383 since this is a very popular print stock that people like to use. Then I'm going to go and select this print stock also in my chromaticity. So I'm going to go and say, hey, give me actually a modern version of 2383, right? As you can see, I have a selection of different profiles because different laboratories simply give us different results. Okay, so I'm going to go for this modern. Now, let me check my Ed Lachman zones again, just to see, does this change my exposure? No, it's looking very good. It just feels like a little bit more contrasty. Fantastic. Then I'm going to go into post-processing. Post-processing is optional. You have to enable it if you want it. What it does, it effectively allows me to, in this case, when I select option FPE, to emulate accurately to what gamut we would be getting if we were really to printing on film stock. So you see, this is kind of really what it would look like if we were to print it on stock and then scan it from there. So you have like a, an ability to get very accurate, you know, visually. Or you can also use an ENR, which is um, uh, also called uh, bleach bypass. In one of the future tutorials, I'm going to explain a little bit more how these controls work and, and, and what they like. So there we go. I have very quickly, <laughs> in step by step, created a unique, my own, film emulation look and profile. Um, I have color managed ARRI from 
log c to 709. And then just before I was to proceed, you know, copying this look to all the other clips, I'm just going to go quickly and test it. So this is the last part of look designer. So I'm going to quickly use my tone map, which is going to then show me if I then go into color tab and I look into my waveform monitor, it's going to show me how my S-curve is created. So it looks very good. I have here my mid density around 400, which is this gray. Um, then I'm going to go and check what's happening with my lightness ramp. Are there any distortions, any problems there? And then I'm also going to check my saturation ramp and everything looks pretty clean. So there we go. This is our very first film emulation look using Look Designer for Adobe Premiere.